Well, uh, good morning to you all. Uh, well, first, uh, I need to thank you for joining this online introduction session on how, how to build a computer uh, security incident handling response team, which is known as CERT and, and uh, Trans61 program. So uh, I kindly welcome all of you for this introduction session and I hope and I wish that all of you will gain more knowledge, more information and more understanding how and why it is important to us. So uh, let me introduce the trainers, presenters, uh, we'll be going to conduct Transix One program uh, online course for you. Uh, Jamie, shall we uh, change the slide please? Uh, so, uh, well, uh, this is me. Well, uh, there will be two presenters. It, it will be uh, me, myself, and Jamie. So, uh, let me introduce myself first. And I know that most of, uh, like all of you know who, who really, who really me. Uh, but let me introduce myself to whom doesn't know about me. Well, uh, I'm Dinesh and I'm attached with LEARN, which is known as Lanka Education and Research network uh, which operates as as the NREN. NREN is a national research education and network in Sri Lanka and since uh, 2009 and uh, I have been attached with LEARN uh, since 2011 so it's almost like uh, nine years. So uh, well uh, LEARN CERT, uh, we have implemented LEARN CERT uh, from uh, since 2018 to serve our members as an additional service, value-added service, and uh, I have been appointed to play the coordination role to implement this service and aware you, aware uh, our community about this. Also, let me tell like how I involved in transit or like how did I join transit? Uh, well, first uh, I attended, I got this opportunity to uh, attend Transit 1 in APAN 45, which was uh, held in March uh, in 2018 in Singapore. And then uh, after I complete that uh, program, then I was invited uh, uh, as presenter uh, to Transit 1 in APAN 46. Usually we, uh, Transit uh, were conducting in a collateral program with APAN or APNIC. So uh, this was uh, uh, held. This was held in August uh, 2018, same year in Auckland. And then finally, I was invited to attend the Transit Train the Trainer Program, which was held in September in 2019 in uh, Chiang Mai. So uh, before we uh, begin, uh, I, I welcome Jamie Gillespie. Welcome, Jamie. Uh, well, Jamie is the security specialist, specialist of EPNIC. EPNIC is Asia Pacific Network Center in uh, uh, Brisbane in Australia. I think the head office is in Australia. And uh, he's like, I know Jamie like because uh, he's one of my best trainer that I met in this uh, transit program during my program, which I attended in APAN and EPNIC conferences. So Jamie, welcome to you. Welcome you to Sri Lanka through online. So let's... Uh, Thank you very much, Dinesh. So uh, I think it's better, let's uh, ask James, James to introduce himself to you. We'll give more information about him as well. Uh, yeah. But, before, yeah, but before, Jamie, I hand over to you, uh, I would like to give, a, give you a quick introduction on, uh, like, about what we are going to do today. So you will have uh, idea of what we are going to do today and definitely uh, Jamie and me will give you an informative uh, presentation on that. Jamie has, a, Jamie has prepared a presentation on that. Uh, so my dear friends, uh, after we conduct this uh, introduction session on CZ and Transit 1 program, uh, we, will, uh, we are hoping to conduct a full online course on Transit 1 program. And there and uh, and there will be under this program there will be four modules we will be covering organizational module, operational module, technical module, and legal module. Uh, so we will give you a brief idea of these uh, of, of each each module today, and uh, you will be able to get a general knowledge uh, of what we are going to conduct in this transit program. Uh, also talking about the objective of this program online program is to make all of you aware 
how to establish, implement, and how you can render this service among us, among Learn community. So we hope to provide you security information, uh, process and protocol, and necessary actions to be taken at the right time and at the right incident, and uh, other incident handling. And uh, we will discuss and disseminate uh, uh, cybersecurity related incidents and what caused for the network or technical resources after such cyber attack happened. So we will explain uh, with some examples happening in different Asian countries and definitely we will share some more information about in Iraq uh, in, in that region. So uh, also at the end of the uh, session, uh, we will request you to uh, fill an online feedback form where we will uh, we'll share the link details later or end of this session. So uh, let me hand over, uh, let me ask Jamie to uh, begin with uh, giving a small introduction about himself. And after that, uh, I think we can, uh, Jamie, we can ask like few participants to uh, introduce themselves. We have like 26, maybe we can't go through all of them. Maybe few. Yeah, sounds good, Dinesh. Thank you. So just to go through a, a short introduction of myself, uh, my name is Jamie Gillespie. I'm one of the uh, security specialists here at APNIC and APNIC as our main business is the regional internet registry for the entire Asia Pacific region. Uh, so we're delegating and managing the IP address allocations um, throughout the region. Um, my role as a security specialist here um, I do some of my work as internal security for the company of APNIC, but a large part of my work is actually doing uh, training, education, capacity building throughout the region. So running sessions like this, doing technical hands-on training, um, helping set up national CERT teams, um, as well as working with law enforcement in the public safety sector as well to ensure that they have the knowledge to do investigations very similar to how a CERT team would do their investigations as well. Uh, my personal interests, of course, incident response, physical security, uh, the security outreach, as well as the technical and awareness training. My background, I've been working in information security for 19, maybe 20 years now of dedicating my career to information security. I started off working for the Australian national CERT team called AusCERT. I worked there for about uh, eight years. I moved down from um, Brisbane, Australia to Sydney. I worked for Google uh, for their internal security for several years. I worked for an Australian based cloud services provider. And um, for the past two and a half years, I've been back up in Brisbane working for AP Nick. So uh, yeah, for the entire time that Dinesh has been doing the transits learning through the APAN conferences, that's been part of my engagement into the research and education network sector as well. Um, so yeah, I've been working for a national CERT team. I've been a transits trainer. I think I did the first transits training probably about 17 years ago. So um, I've, I've been very familiar to this material and how it's been uh, updated over time. Um, now that was the introduction for me. Um, just a very brief overview, you know, AP Nix and our security outreach that we do primarily looking at network operators and service providers. Um, that's our main membership for APNIC, so that's who we're serving. But a lot of the, the work that we do is serving the wider um, internet audience throughout the region. Um, more information on apnic.net slash security as mentioned on the slide here. Now, what we're going to do is we're just going to have um, some of you introduce yourselves. Now, we don't need you to come on uh, as audio to do the introduction through Zoom. We do have, what, about 26 attendees at the moment, so that could take quite a bit of time. Um, but one thing that we're looking at for this larger group that we've got, which is excellent, is using Zoom. Um, so in your Zoom client that you're uh, connected to right now, there should be a button for chat. And if you click on that, it should pop open a little window that allows you to see a chat um, amongst people. Now, by default, everyone's chat setting will be to all panelists. That means it only comes to Dinesh and myself. What we want you to do is change that setting to all panelists and attendees. And when you do that, 
then when you type a chat message, it goes to everybody who's attending this session. So as you introduce yourself, that will go out to everybody and everybody can see who else is here, where they're from and what their interests are. So as the example is here at the bottom, we're looking for you to uh, give your name, uh, the institution or organization that you're from, your designation, and just a, a brief word or two on your interests in security, um, what you hope to do in the future, what you're doing now, or things like that. So as you see at the bottom here, Jamie Gillespie, APNIC security specialist, I'm interested in starting a CSERT for APNIC. So if everybody puts that into chat, then everybody can put it in, everybody sees everybody else's. So I'll just give a, a, a short minute or so, and you know I can keep talking while people put that in. Make sure you scroll up so you can see through the chat and see what, uh, what everyone else is. It's also a good way to make sure that everybody's awake and uh, is working properly on Zoom, <laughs> that your uh, network interface is working well, so. For the moment, only two have been updated their self. This is a parent from Ovelas and uh, okay. Iruna because I'm from University College of Jaffna. So others also can uh, just brief yourself, just uh, put the details on the chat box. And don't be shy, you know, um, <laughs> as we progress through this training, it will try and be a bit interactive in this session. You know, we're going to be doing some question and answer as we go through as well. Um, but as we go into more training, later sessions with transits, it's going to be a, a much closer collaboration, much closer connection between presenters and attendees. So uh, we want to make sure that people are active, are asking questions as they come up and sharing their own insights and information that you may have. So yeah, good seeing a few more people coming in and putting their information in. That's great to see. And again, you know, everybody has the same interest. If you're attending this session, then you're interested in cybersecurity and incident handling. So, um, you know, connecting with each other and forming your own group um, local in your community would always be a nice thing. Now, I'll let uh, everyone keep typing there, and I'll just go through the next couple slides just to talk about how we're going to be running the other interaction for here. So um, let me just close that down for now. So um, when we're going through and doing the rest of the, the Zoom webinar today, we want you to leave your chat setting as panelists and attendees. That way, if you're sharing any information, it goes to the wider group of you, so all attendees will be able to see that information. You can use this to share text, your own stories, information. If you've got some website addresses that are related um, to the discussion, feel free to share it in there, and that goes across everybody else in the group. Now, if you wish to ask a question, please don't use the chat area. The chat area is for chatting amongst all of the attendees. The question and answer area or Q&A button in Zoom is your best way to ask a question to Dinesh or to myself. That way we see your questions and it doesn't get caught up with the chats and we can make sure that we identify that nice and quickly. So in order to ask a question at any time through the presentation, Click on the Q&A button in Zoom. That should pop open a question and answer box. Type in your question from there, and the only people who will see that question is Dinesh and myself. Then at an appropriate time in the presentation, maybe the end of that slide or right away, we'll come in, read out your question, and then we'll try and answer it from there. Um, so please make sure that you ask questions as we go through, um, and don't put the questions into chat. Um, yeah, but you know, re-encouraging here, make sure that you ask questions. This is interactive. If you're thinking of, uh, of a question, it's possible that other people are thinking of the same thing. So come out, ask the question as we go. You don't have to save your questions to the end of the presentation. Just make sure everything's working fine for me. Great, seeing everyone introducing themselves. Good to have everyone here. It's quite a, quite a good turnout. We've got about 26 attendees, which is wonderful. Yes, out of 46, Jamie. Yep, excellent. Also, just to let people know, um, we are um, recording this session. So assuming that the recording works out uh, half decent, um, we'll trim that up and make that available at some point after the presentation. So Dinesh will be working on that um, from his side at Learn. 
Um, so just to uh, start off with an overview of what we're going to be discussing um, through this session, we're going to be looking at cybersecurity in general. We're going to be looking at the different types of security incidents, where they come from, how they happen. We're going to be looking at incident response and how uh, C-certs or computer security incident response teams come into play. We're going to do a quick overview of CERT team policies and standard operating procedures or SOPs. And we're going to look at collaboration and interaction with others. A lot of this information is basically just a sampler of the transits course. And at the end, we're going to learn more about CERT teams, CERT training, and what the full transits course has to offer. So this is sort of an introductory, sort of like a, a trailer for the full movie. So uh, yeah, we'll go through and let's get started. So we're going to um, start off looking at cybersecurity in a nutshell. So just a very broad overview from uh, a perspective. Now, one thing that a lot of people um, start out with when they start out with security is understanding their assets, understanding what has to be protected. And from the regular average user or even an IT manager's perspective, they don't really understand the value of different types of assets that they have. So the first one that we're going to look at here is looking at the value of a hacked email account. A lot of people think, oh, well, if an attacker gets access to my email, what's the worst that can happen? Well, this is a nice little uh, mind map diagram that breaks down a lot of the different areas and specifics of what an attacker can gain from a compromised email account. So of course they can use your email for sending out spam for lots of different purposes. They can harvest a lot of information from your email um, store, from the messages that you've received. Um, employ employment details, if you received employment contracts or tax details through there, a lot of financial information. And of course, it's a huge invasion of privacy. But probably the biggest thing to understand is a compromised email account is usually used to reset passwords for other systems and services. A lot of systems use email as the username as for registration for an account. And if you go to another service and say, I forgot my password, it will send an email link through for resetting the account. So a compromised email account can actually lead on to compromising many other accounts tied to that user. Now, if we go one step further than that, we need to look at then the value of a compromised computer. This is taking it a step further that it's not just an attacker accessing an email account, but the value of an attacker gaining access to your computer. Here, they can actually run processes and run services on this computer. They could set up a web server on your computer to act as a phishing website or for distributing malicious software and viruses or sending out spam. They'll be able to gain a lot more account credentials doing bot activity to join in as part of a distributed denial of service attack or a DDoS attack. They can, of course, steal virtual goods that you may have access accounts. You may have a uh, cryptocurrency wallet that is stored on your computer that they could gain access to. And of course, accessing other accounts that are local on that system. So there's quite a lot of incentive for an attacker to gain access to a full computer. It gives them that much more access than just accessing an individual email account. And then if we take that one step further, and this is where we sell the idea of security and incident response to management and to uh, you know, larger businesses, is looking at the compromised company. This is where an attacker has broken into several computers and several email accounts within an educational institution or within a corporate entity. And this is where the attacker then gains access to intellectual property, human resources data, financial data and information, and sometimes even gaining access to physical controls such as security systems and building management systems. And at this point, the attacker has control over the business or the institution to the point where they can siphon out a lot of money, create a lot of scams, and even hold the um, personal and private information ransom by installing ransomware or otherwise encrypting of hard drives and blocking access to it. 
So that's where we're looking at to try and help people to understand the value of different types of assets that they have without going into the absolute specifics. Now, looking at then information security and how that ties in, you know, as a, a security professional, one of the common things that is talked about and educated out to average users is the CIA triad or the CIA triangle. And this is talking about confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And these concepts and the others that we're discussing on this slide are important for the security professional and important for a business that is setting up incident response or setting up some sort of a plan on how they're going to respond to security incidents. So they, of course, have to understand the three different pillars of security. That's the confidentiality, integrity, and availability. But it's also understanding risk. And a lot of people will use the term risk without breaking it down to its components. So here we're actually breaking it down to a mathematical equation where we look at threats multiplied by vulnerabilities. So threats are the um, events that can cause harm to our systems, to our networks, and to our data. And vulnerabilities are the weaknesses that would allow a threat to take an impact onto the system. Now we do a multiplication here so that if you have a high level of threat but a zero vulnerability level, then when you multiply it out, the whole thing comes down to zero or very low. If you have no threats but you have high vulnerabilities, that as well would then get multiplied and that would come down. That type of a scenario, which may sound weird, would be as if you're having a uh, totally separate network for a lab or a test network. You may have a lot of vulnerabilities on this totally isolated network, but if it's totally isolated, there's very little threats. There's you know, very little threats from the internet or wider interconnected networks that could impact it. Now, to truly understand risk, you have to take in an understanding of your assets. That's why we were talking about the value of an email account, a computer, and a company network. So you may have a certain level of threat and a certain level of vulnerability, but if that is applied to a test system, that would have a low asset sensitivity, bringing the whole risk down. Or if it's one of your uh, production servers, one of your uh, forward facing, you know, your public website for your institution, that would have a much higher asset value or asset sensitivity. So when you multiply threat times vulnerability times asset, the whole thing comes up to a higher level of risk. And the idea is that you apply this to many different threats and vulnerabilities and assets, and you end up with a risk register or a matrix of different risks that you have that are classified as high, medium, and low so that you understand which risks that you have to address first. Now, you do have to deal with a little bit of what is known, which is easy, and you have to deal with a bit of the unknown, which is harder. It's harder to quantify threats that you don't know or vulnerabilities that you don't know because they haven't been discovered yet. So we want to try and educate as much as possible. And there's a lot of programs that will go through and bring out historical information for this. And this type of information is the same thing used for business continuity planning. There are a lot of organizations that will understand business risk. And this is the same terminology for cybersecurity risk. So if we use the same terminology as the business risk people, it makes it a lot easier to communicate with higher levels of management. Now, the cybersecurity program will have a lot of different areas. Now, a cybersecurity program may have your standard network engineers doing security tasks. It may have your system administrators doing certain types of security tasks, but it usually will include or should include an incident response procedure at some point. This may not be a dedicated team. This might just be various individuals across different parts of the IT department that will have responsibility for security and responding to incidents, or for a larger and more mature organization, having it properly documented out on who is doing what tasks and maybe forming a dedicated team. And of course, for cybersecurity, we're looking at frameworks and standards. There's a lot of these that relate to different organizations or different business types. There's the PCI DSS standard that's dealing with the payment card industry. 
So if you're needing to uh, accept Visa, MasterCard, credit card details directly to your systems, you probably will have to fall under compliance for that. The US NIST, they have a uh, set of uh, security frameworks that have been published. There's the ISO standard 27001. There's a lot of these different frameworks and standards to go through and use. Not every organization will find the best benefit from each one. So it's going through and finding the appropriate one to deploy to your systems and networks. Now, looking at security from a sort of a, a different angle, we looked at confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Looking at it from the side is looking at different aspects of the security implementation. We need to make sure that we understand and educate the people. We need to make sure that we have documented and secure processes, and that we're using the right technology to keep our networks and systems secure. Now, looking at this then from a timeline where you're going to be going from before, during, and after an incident, you want to make sure that you are spreading your security controls across detecting incidents, preventing incidents, and responding to incidents. So you want to make sure that you prevent them before they ever happen, that you are detecting them if they are happening so that you can find them quickly, and that you're responding appropriately so that you can get rid of this security uh, threat and get your systems back to normal as quickly as possible. Now, security is definitely a process. It is not a destination. You will never find a, a reasonable company stand up and say, we are 100% secure. It is very difficult for a company to say that because the very next minute after they say that statement, a new vulnerability could come out or a threat could be modified, thus making their systems insecure. So security is definitely a process. It's not something that you can do one time, say we are secure and then go back to your other businesses. This is where you need to go through. You need to have a constant vulnerability management process. You need to have an incident process so that when you are managing incidents that you're actually learning from the lessons that you learned from those and using those lessons learned in order to go forward and protect your systems from the next incidents as well. And of course, understanding what the best current practices are. These best practices do change over time. Some areas don't change as much, but for security, things do change quite regularly. What used to be secure last year now is totally different and needs to be updated and modified. Now, we do have some additional training at the APNIC Academy, um, but the training that we're going to be focusing on through here is the transits training that we'll discuss into the four modules at the end of this session. So we're going to break down and actually look at what is a C-CERT. So a C-CERT is a computer security incident response team. You may see this sometimes written as a CERT which is a computer emergency response team. Both of them are pretty much the same. It comes down to how that they are implemented. And originally the CERT name was a trademark of Carnegie Mellon University in the United States when they created CERT CC. So people can use the CERT name, but you just have to ask permission for it. So that's why you'll see some names on both sides. So first we need to look at security incidents because that's what this team is looking for. So security incident is a <clears throat> violation or imminent threat of violation to your security policies, your acceptable use policies, or your standard security practices. So if you don't have security policies or acceptable use policies in place already, it can actually make it quite hard to determine if something is a security incident or not. So examples here, an attacker commands a botnet to send high volumes of connection requests to a web server, causing it to crash. We also have users being tricked into opening a financial report that was sent by email that actually contains viruses or malware. This runs tools on their infected computers and establishes outbound connections to an external host. And finally, we've got an attacker obtaining sensitive data and threatening that the details will be released publicly if the organization 
doesn't pay a ransom amount of money. So these are examples of security incidents. We're looking at a violation of a security policy or an acceptable use policy. Some wide variety of examples of incidents that we have is malicious software or malware causing financial loss or loss of data. This could be malware that's installed on point of sale machines like cash registers. You have banking Trojans that are stealing banking login credentials. And of course, ransomware as shown on the picture here where it encrypts a hard drive and demands Bitcoin or similar cryptocurrency in order to unlock the computer. But you also have data breaches of organizations. This is where an attacker breaks into a network and steals data from that organization. This could be intellectual property loss, which is very large for research institutions. And of course, on the more commercial side, you have customer information and confidential information as well that could be quite valuable to an organization. You also have critical vulnerabilities in software, and this can lead to system compromises or information disclosure. So understanding the vulnerabilities that are publicly accessible and attackers compromising those vulnerabilities. You of course have distributed denial of service attacks. These are uh, quite common and have been growing larger as time goes on. There are plenty of smaller uh, DDoS attacks, but the largest ones are up in the terabits per second range. And there is some information, some links here, and these slides and video will be made available to you uh, after this presentation as well. So don't worry about uh, having to copy down these links. We'll get these sent out to you. Now, looking at another view of security incidents, this is from a website called Information is Beautiful, and um, they have different visualizations for things. Here on this one page, they're visualizing the world's biggest data breaches. Now, this is actually an interactive uh, uh, slide here. Um, I can't bring it up on the slide, but the website is interactive. So if you go to that website address, in your browser, you can hover your mouse over the different circles, and it will actually bring up information about those compromises. The different data breaches can be sorted by different colors and sizes. So the size of the circle gives an indication on how large the data breach was. And of course, looking at from another perspective, not so much a data breach, but a credential breach, the website haveibeenpwned.com tracks account credentials that have been um, attacked, exposed, and shared or leaked out onto the internet. So this is usernames and passwords, where a web server that uh, would normally store usernames and passwords for users gets attacked, their password database is stolen, decrypted, and shared out wide. And the problem here is not so much the password for that account, but if users are reusing passwords across many other systems, the attackers will be able to use the same username and password and automatically try logging into many, many different systems, basically doing a mass compromise for a large number of users very quickly. And you can see here some of the statistics and these numbers have increased even since I've created these slides You've got over 400 websites that have been uh, compromised, leading to uh, over eight and a half billion um, accounts. And of course, pasted credentials where the usernames and passwords are copied and shared across um, through the different uh, dark websites where the attackers share this sorts of information. And another type of uh, security incident that we look at is website defacements. Now these are different to the previous um, two types of incidents that we we're looking at, that here the main motivation is the attackers breaking into a web server and changing the home page, either adding in their own information, modifying details, or putting up a big screenshot picture. Now here it's usually politically motivated or motivated by the attacker gaining their own uh, notoriety saying, look at how good an attacker I am. I've broken into all of these websites. And there's even a website, this one here is zoneh.org, that actually tracks almost like a scoreboard to keep track of which websites have been attacked and which attacker is claiming responsibility for it. So it's very public and everybody can see 
if a website has actually been attacked and defaced in this way. So a large damage to reputation um, and public relations or communications for your institutions um, would be, uh, you know, <laughs> working overtime in order to try and uh, go into damage control for this type of a very public incident. We also have common vulnerabilities that can lead to mass compromises. As a lot of software is becoming very common and very popular, you can then have vulnerabilities. And if a vulnerability exists in common software, it can lead to mass compromises or worm activity. Examples here, we have SQL database servers that were on public IP addresses and not firewalled appropriately. Vulnerability in an SQL server led to over 70,000 websites being automatically compromised by a script and tool. You also have other websites being attacked and compromised. Here you have WordPress, both the server and WordPress plugins having vulnerabilities over time that allows for attackers to take control over a WordPress server and sometimes gaining access to the operating system as well. And of course, at the bottom, you have a mention of Ticketmaster, a ticket selling website that even three months after they suffered a large public attack, that the similar vulnerability still existed in over a thousand websites. So this is a very large problem. And you can imagine that the attackers are reusing this vulnerability information to attack more and more websites over time. Now we can look at security incidents from a lot of different ways. You can look at it from the impact of the security incident. Was this a breach of confidentiality? Was this a breach of integrity? Or was this a breach of availability? So here you have disclosure of information. That's a breach of confidentiality. You've got the impact is the system integrity has been modified. Either uh, files have been changed, viruses installed. And that, of course, is a breach of the integrity side of things. Same thing for authorized access. That can lead to a breach of confidentiality, integrity, and availability. And a denial of service attack is, of course, a breach of your availability of your services. You can also look at the attack surface. How is the attacker able to get onto your systems or what vulnerabilities exist? Did they find a weakness in your malware or antivirus defenses? Did they find a weakness through your spam filters? Did they find websites and web server plugins that you're hosting that have their own vulnerabilities? Do they have straight up network access into your systems by um, having out of date firewall policies? Or are they targeting your end users, sending them messages and having your end users downloading and executing code or performing financial transactions without the proper authority? Now, of course, we can also look at it from the different types of attackers that are attacking. You can look at their motives and you can look at what types of attackers they are. And this can range from what we sometimes call script kiddies. These are the, usually the younger attackers or younger in skill for attacking that are usually just downloading free tools or scripts and running them without truly understanding how the attack is actually operating. They run a program, something happens, and it works or doesn't work. You can then go all the way up on the high end of things to organized criminals or disorganized criminals as well that are going after a financial motivation. And of course, there is the nation state attackers. If you go through the news looking at security events or cybersecurity events, you will find a wide range of different countries and economies and nation states that are either advertising their strong defenses or offense as a defense, or you'll find other countries complaining of being attacked by their neighboring countries or their uh, you know, not so friendly adversaries. So looking at a CERT team and how this fits into security incidents, a CERT performs, coordinates, and supports the response to security incidents. And this is usually done within a defined constituency or member base. So you may have a CERT team for a company or for a university, and their constituency would largely be 
the institution, the company, or the university themselves. And universities actually get quite interesting because then you have to define the constituency. Is the CERT team only handling incidents for the university networks and staff? Or is the CERT team also looking after and providing support for security incidents against students as well? You also will have national CERT teams, and these would look after uh, government and federal agencies, as well as the general population security incident con and concerns that they may have. In ways which the specific community agree on in its general interest. And here what we have is looking at how the reaction is actually handled. The reaction does not have to be an active reaction of retaliation as we see in the movies, but there has to be some sort of a response. And there's usually the best practices that different CERT teams have developed and will share amongst each other through information sharing networks as well. And don't forget the T of a CERT stands for team. And here we have to make sure that the incident response capabilities are being done as a group effort or a team effort. If you only have one person who is managing incident response and they're not bringing in members of the team from other areas, it's going to be very difficult for them to try and uh, have command over the incident in what actions need to take place if network firewall changes need to happen, if host-based security needs to happen, if security devices need to be implemented and connected in and managed centrally. All of these things take quite a lot of coordination effort, and that's why this is a definitely a team-based activity. Now, when we look at constituency, here I mentioned a few of the other ones before, but examples of the constituency, we have enterprise or single organization. You can have a sector-based CERT team. I know in Thailand, they have a banking sector CERT team, which actually goes across all banks and financial institutions in Thailand. Even though these organizations are in competition with each other, they have a common goal of making sure that all of their networks and all of the citizens' information is kept secure and private. You may have a critical infrastructure CERT team focusing on national critical infrastructure. And sometimes you'll have a company or product-based CERT team. Cisco was very popular for this when they created their product security team such that it was focusing on the security of their Cisco products and they had a separate team at the time that was looking after the Cisco internal network security. You of course may have national or country-based CERT teams and of course you may have customer-based CERT teams. You may even have CERT teams that are offering CERT as a service or security as a service and sometimes these are referred to as managed service or managed security service providers or MSSPs. What we're looking at here is the purpose of the CERT team, who they are serving, what types of incidents they're going to be handling, and how does this CERT team have a relationship or a coordination with similar or other CERT teams worldwide. Now, this is just going through a, a bit more of an example uh, with a write-up of each of the CERT teams. Of importance, of course, is up in the top corner is the enterprise and academic CERT teams. This is providing uh, incident handling services to their parent organization. This could, of course, be for a bank for an enterprise, or it could be for a university or similar research institution. Now, just because you may have one CERT team that is handling something for one university, it doesn't mean that you can't have a larger overarching CERT team. That's where we come into coordination centers. This is where you usually have an organization that is operating CERT capabilities, but their primary goal is coordinating and bringing different teams together. So what we're looking at here is the example is the US CERT which is the US government-based CERT team that is actually coordinating all of the different CERT teams within the boundaries of the United States of America. You'll also have some national research and education networks, 
such as maybe Learn, that is running a CSERT team themselves. And one of the options that they can operate as is as a coordination capability. This is if you have the individual institutions and academic uh, networks having their own CERT teams, you can have the national NREN setting up a coordination to bring them all together to provide that forum for sharing information and making each other even more productive and useful to your constituencies. On the slide on the right, you may hear about analysis centers. These are usually called ISACs or Information Sharing and Analysis Center, ISAC. These are usually sector-based, so you may have a financial sector ISAC or a mining and minerals ISAC or a, um, a critical infrastructure ISAC. All of these different sharing and analysis centers are exactly that. They are not so much for responding to incidents, but providing a way for information sharing and analysis. Uh, and then, of course, vendor teams that I had here, that one's looking at certs working within a vendor organization. Cisco having its own cert team, Juniper having its cert team, Huawei, et cetera, et cetera. And the incident response providers at the bottom, these are the ones that are providing incident response as a service. Uh, Jamie. Uh, yes, Dinesh. Yes, uh, we have uh, under QA, uh, we have two questions uh, raised by um, our, our participant. Uh, can, can I let him to talk? To raise, I think we have answer. I suppose I think he might got the answer from your presentation, but uh, to more clarified, shall I let him to uh, ask you? Yeah, well, I, I can go through the, the first one a little bit. So um, the first question, um, where uh, the question is, uh, when this is completed, what do you see happening? So at the finish of this session, what we're going to be doing is sending out a feedback form to everyone um, and having you not just give feedback on the session, but what do you want in the future? And at the end of the session, we're going to be talking about the four different transits modules that make up the entire transits training course. So we're looking at, you know, do people want to go through and attend all four training modules? It's going to be like when this is run face to face, it's run as a two day program, but we'll break it up into smaller chunks. And that's some of the questions that we're asking is what times of day and which days of the week are best for you. But we're looking at a basically four half day sessions and that will give you a certificate that you've completed the Transits 1 training course. Do we, we do talk about that a bit later on. Now, the Transits yeah. training course is leading towards people that are new to a CERT team or are interested in building and starting your own CERT capability. Now, this doesn't have to be a big advertised public CERT team, but at least having some sort of incident response capability mm -hmm. so that you have a point of contact if an incident is happening on your network, other people can let you know by coming in through that CERT point of contact information. So what we see happening from this course, this is the introductory leading on to a four part training course that we'll be delivering online. Dinesh, I believe, will be doing half of it. I'll be doing the other half. Um, and that will lead to a certificate in transits from there. From after that, it's then a bit more of an individual case by case providing technical assistance or management assistance on setting up a CERT team. And that can be done locally within Sri Lanka or bringing in partners from other countries as well. Was there anything? Yeah, so Arshad, yeah, so uh, did you, is it clarified for you, Arshad? You can hear me, right? Uh, well, I just allowed him to talk. And also his uh, next question was uh, why this is important right now. I think uh, during your presentation it was clarified well, but still, if you have something to add, Jamie, yes. Um, well, you know, th this is important yeah. now. This, this was important 10 years ago. This will be important 10 years from now. Um, 
basically my understanding, and Dinesh can, can correct me if I'm uh, a bit off on this, you know, LEARN as a national research and education network has been doing a large investment into computer security and network security, not just for the LEARN network, but for all of the institutions that fall in as their member organizations and connecting into LEARN as well. And the understanding is that if you know, two or three of the, the connected institutions are weak in their security, it will actually have an impact on everyone else in the, uh, the networking institutions under LEARN as well. So, you know, why we're doing this now, LEARN has been building up their capabilities, Dinesh has been going through the training, has done the train the trainer program, and is kicking this off local in Sri Lanka. As far as research and education networks in general, some have been doing it already, some are working on this type of project now, and some have yet to even get to this stage as well. There's many even countries and economies that haven't set up a national CERT team yet. So different organizations, APNIC is one of them, we are trying to help build up the capacity, train up and show the importance for countries, economies, sectors, institutions, companies, for everyone to build up their own CERT capability. It doesn't have to be a large team. It can even be done with existing personnel, but at least having the capability of handling security incidents properly and how they collaborate with others within the industry. So we're working on this now because the best time to start is now. Better time would be to invent a time machine and go back 10 years and do it 10 years ago. <laughs> Uh, well, I think uh, we answered uh, his two corrections, uh, and we will uh, we will during our presentation still uh, you will understand uh, we will give more why we why it is more important for us why we should implement this service and uh, to get to take necessary action on this at the right time as well, and also Jamie, but I uh, my personal view is to uh, given a quality a fast moving network. This is more important for us as we are an ISP provider for our academic community. Uh, when, when these incidents happen, maybe the quality of network will be reduced. So we need to maintain, maintain our network and safeguard the network. Yeah, and especially having, um, you know, such high bandwidth, it is a very uh, attractive target to a lot of attackers. Yes. So you're, you're almost uh, painting a bullseye on your backs by advertising how much bandwidth you have through, you know, a, a, a large interconnected NREN like yourselves. Um, yes. Got one more question that's come in. Uh, Manoj is asking uh, how CERT's different from CERT. And uh, the spelling here is a CSIRT, how that is different from a CERT. So um, Manoj, basically they are the exact same thing. What we have is CERT was actually trademarked when it was created. So in order to use the CERT name, you actually have to ask permission. Now, you don't have to pay licensing fees or anything, but you do have to ask permission and be a, a setup and operational CERT team. Whereas CSIRT is not trademarked. It's not a protected acronym or term or anything. <coughs> anybody can use CSIRT without asking for permission. And there's actually some modifications for this as well. Sometimes I've seen just IRT for incident response team, and sometimes I see it as an SIRT or security incident response team. So every organization will have their different naming and acronyms, um, but just looking at CERT originally was a, a trademark term. You can still use it if you ask Carnegie Mellon University nicely and they'll uh, register it and give you permission. Hopefully that answers that question. And yeah, just a <laughs> reminder, you know, please everyone put questions in uh, as you see fit and um, we'll uh, answer as we can. Okay, back to the slides. I think I covered this slide all the way through. Um, what you see here, the US CERT um, is the newer uh, predecessor, the, the newer equivalent to the original CERT CC. 
So that's the one at Carnegie Mellon University was uh, CERT CC. So why a C cert? Why have a C cert? And you know, one of the biggest ones is security incidents are always going to happen. There is no way to completely get rid of security incidents. So having a C cert actually gives you the proper procedures, processes, and people thinking about how best to develop these processes and procedures and implement them across all areas of the institution or of the network. This will also give assurance to your customers and your stakeholders that you are managing security properly and taking security as a very important critical concern to keep their information private. And it's general best practice. Because you're going to have incidents, you need to have some sort of organization or skills to respond to those incidents so that the incidents don't happen again, so they don't get worse, and so they don't impact other people on the network or across the internet. Now, having a CSERT team can help mitigate loss or damage as well. This will provide points of contact. So right now, for any of your organizations, if you don't have a CERT team, but I detect malicious activity coming from your network, who am I going to contact? Um, you know, contact at university.lk or you know, hostmaster or webmaster or security. Having a CSERT team actually has you registered as points of contact and it's advertised and publicly known how best to get in touch with the security responders for those organizations. And having the security responders finding out about an incident quickly means they can respond quickly and mitigate the damage. They can decrease the damage being caused by these security incidents. Now, of course, this can also be used for compliance to standards. If you have to comply with ITIL or ISO 27001 or the payment card industry standards, Part of those standards says having an incident response capability such as a CSERT team. So you may have laws and other regulatory compliances, particularly if you're handling private information. Um, if your educational institution is classed as a government entity, you may have government responsibilities. And if you're dealing with health information, for some countries, you have certain regulation requirements for handling, processing, and storing personal health details as well. A CERT team can be used for security improvements. That is that they can go through and analyze the incidents, they can go through the lessons learned, and they can actually provide education to the people that are building the networks and secure systems so that they can learn from the incidents and how they happened. And of course, we're looking at resource allocation, you know, looking at the different resources that you have available for it and it just you know using best use of what you have and what you need to bring into an organization looking at the human resources and the skills that are around the CSERT team can help build the security policies build the standard operating procedures operate as the point of contact and operating as a dedica dedicated service for incident response now, looking at that point of contact mention, what we have in the Asia Pacific region is actually who is records that contain an IRT object. And you see this in the larger uh, zoomed in view of the red box. That IRT object is a mandatory field for every network holding IP addresses across Asia Pacific region and across the other regions of the internet as well, sometimes with different terminology. Sometimes they'll call it the abuse contact or the IRT contact is here. And this is the best contact information. So if you needed to contact the incident response team for APNIC, abuse at apnic.net as advertised here. And if you needed to, for whatever reason, send us postal mail, um, the PO box mailing address is there as well. Although I'll, I'll tell you that email is definitely a lot faster to reach us. Now, it's not just in the who is records that this information is recorded as points of contact. You also have membership databases for organizations that are collections of CERT teams. 
The most prominent one here is called FIRST. Now, FIRST is uh, originally an acronym. It stands for the Forum of Incident Response and Security Teams, or FIRST. The website, as you see mentioned at the top of the screenshot here, is first.org. And here we have an example of contact information for uh, BGD CERT. So this is the Bangladesh um, e-government CERT team. And you can see here, CERT, they've gone with the acronym of CIRT, standing for Computer Incident Response Team. Here you've got contact phone numbers, email addresses, a fax number, uh, their postal address, the time zone that they're in, their hours of operation, when you can expect a, a response from. And I think on the next slide, yep, if you had, uh, if that was a website and scrolled down, you would also have their encryption public key. So here, the common one for CERT teams is using PGP for secure communication. So if you needed to communicate to this CERT team or any of the others, they'll have a public PGP key so you can send encrypted communication so that it doesn't leak out if you are mentioning about a security incident or a major vulnerability. So this is a large database of different CERT teams in different parts of the world looking after different constituencies. So who is for IP access is one way, and the first website or list of membership is another way of finding these points of contact. Jamie, so, uh, okay. Jamie, I have a one correction regarding uh, first membership. Uh, Jamie, yeah. is it only is it only given for the national certs, or is it uh, is it like entrants can like like as local certs can uh, get the membership for? First. Absolutely. Local CERT teams can join in as members of FIRST. So if you were running a university uh, CERT team, you can absolutely join in as a member of FIRST. Now, there are different levels of membership within FIRST, and the more common higher level membership requires your CERT team to be fully operational. That means having a point of contact, having policies, having procedures, handling incidents in the proper way and understanding the communication protocols with other teams. Now there is lower levels of membership, more like an affiliate member uh, that you can join in. So you can join in without having that complete setup, but as a CERT team is being built and as it becomes more mature, they usually will look at becoming a full member of FIRST. And when you're a full member, you gain more access to the information sharing and the secure communications amongst other first cert members but um yes absolutely check out the website first.org to look at those lower levels of affiliate membership that you can join in and gain some of the benefits they also run um uh, regional conferences called tcs or technical colloquiums and they run a international annual conference that goes around different parts of the world each year. Um, last year, it was in uh, Edinburgh, Scotland. The year before that, it was in Kuala Lumpur in Malaysia. And this year in June, the annual conference will be in Montreal, Canada. So um, as you can see, it, it moves around the world quite a lot. So, you know, if you might find it hard to uh, make it out to uh, Canada for this year, keep an eye out for that in the future. Additionally, um, in the Asia Pacific region, APNIC helps host a one day conference through FIRST as part of their TCs, um, as part of the APNIC conferences. So once or twice a year, we'll run those. So when we were in Chiang Mai, um, as part of the Train the Trainer program last year, in the APNIC conference, we had a one day FIRST TC session going on that was open to the public for anybody to join in. Um, the next one is part of the Apricot conference, which will be the end of February in Melbourne, Australia. So um, just a, a few hours flight for me. So that's nice and close. Um, and then after that, I think the next APNIC conference is in Bangladesh, I think. Um, I could be wrong, but I think it's in Bangladesh. Um, and we haven't proposed it yet, but we'll probably be looking at running a one day security track there as well. So we are coming up into uh, the, the Southeast Asia region towards the end of this year. So keep an eye out for that as well. Um, 
got a question here. Um, Segarica, Segarica asking, to form a CERT team, what are the basic requirements? Um, we'll actually be going through that through some of the, um, the slides through here in transits. Um, but the basic requirements is operating as a point of contact and having somebody that actually has the authority to respond to security incidents. Um, usually this involves having management support and having management declare that the CERT team is official, that it is being managed appropriately, but it doesn't require hiring new staff. At the beginning, a lot of teams will actually have this built on top of the IT department. And they may build it on top of regular incident handling. You know, a network operating team or network engineers will have ways of handling network incidents, such as outages. Now, that's not necessarily a security incident, but it is very similar in how that they're actually processing things. So the basic requirements is having management support, a point of contact being advertised within your constituency, and making it aware of how you're handling the security incidents. On the larger side of things, I've seen small countries set up a dedicated CERT team with as small as three people, usually one manager and two technical staff. Sometimes it's two managers and one technical staff, um, but that's on the small end of things of having dedicated team members within there. But, um, but please understand, you don't have to hire additional staff to do the basic start of a CERT team. And we'll be going through that through the full transits course as well. Okay, so let's move on. Let's look at components of a, uh, a CSERT team. So we of course talked about policies and procedures or standard operating procedures. This is a big one. When starting up a CERT team, you'll have to have policies and procedures. And this is partially for external people outside of the CERT to understand what you're doing and how you're doing it, but it's also to provide guidance for the people inside the CERT and providing that response capability. If you have policies and procedures, then they know exactly how they're supposed to respond to an incident rather than just doing what they think is right, which might be different for every incident or different for every person responding to an incident. This, of course, will define the scope of the CERT team and their operations, how far reaching do they go, what their roles and responsibilities actually are. The policies and procedures will also dictate what information can be shared. There may be some private information which can only be kept within the CERT team, but if it's anonymized or made more sanitized for public consumption, that could be shared with other CERT teams. So understanding what are the procedures and policies around that. Um, and of course, dealing with a crisis. You know, when an incident becomes large or unmanageable by the CERT in their own capability, how do they escalate it? How do they escalate internally within the organization? And if needing external assistance, how do they escalate externally? Who makes the call for this escalation? Who actually does the management of communication for this escalation as well. And of course, dealing with, with the media and press. You know, if this is a very public incident, such as uh, an entire network being taken down by a DDoS attack or a website being defaced, you might have the media or the press contacting in. And if they contact into the CERT team, you want to make sure that you have those procedures and policies on what the CERT team members are supposed to say and how they're supposed to respond. Now, of course, you can run a CERT team in many different types of structures. And this is what I was alluding to with some of the other question and answers that have come through. You know, if you're operating in team models, you can have it as a central incident response team. This is usually one team, sometimes dedicated staff, sometimes staff that are borrowed from existing departments, but where they're operating as a dedicated incident response team for the entire organization. You may also have a distributed incident response team where you have people performing incident response activities in the networking area, 
in the server administration area, the workstation administration area, and other facets of the business or institution. And that distributed incident response team might even be a combination of distributed and central where the incident response team provides incident response for the entire organization, but the membership, the actual technical staff who do the response might be one network engineer, one Linux administrator, and one Windows administrator, plus an IT manager. And that forms sort of like a virtual incident response team of four staff. Now, if you're dealing with a multinational um, organization, you might have to have time zone distributed. When I was working at Google, we had security center offices based in California, Zurich, Switzerland, and Sydney, Australia. And each one of them did a follow the sun operation where each one covered eight hours of the day, ensuring 24 hour coverage for somebody in a local time zone. And of course, a team model might be a coordination team. We talked about that before, where you can have an overarching CERT coordination team looking over smaller CERT teams for individual businesses, organizations, institutes, or even individual departments within a company that might be quite large. Now, you've got the functions and workflow as well for CERT teams. You know, you've got to look at what the incident reporting workflow is going to be. How do you manage reports from inside your organization? And how do you manage reports that are coming in from external sources? What are you actually going to do with the incident analysis? How are you going to find out what is happening? How are you going to find out the impact? And how are you going to assess patterns of intrusion or attacks across many different incidents that may have happened previously? And then there's the actual root of incident response. And this is quite a large section in the transits course. We touch on it in the next few slides, but we look at the procedure of incident response. We look at going through identification of the incident, and then you look at containing the incident, eradicating the incident, and recovering from the incident. And then going through any post-incident activities, such as lessons learned, and how to take that information to be better prepared for the next incident that happens. Now, we of course can have different services that are proactive and reactive. The core one here under reactive is incident handling. Pretty much the very first service that a CERT team will provide is incident handling service because that is the nature of a CERT team itself. Now, these other ones that are listed here are options. These are not mandatory. This is not a progression that every CERT team will follow. These are options depending upon the needs of the organization. Some organizations may have a need for vulnerability handling. If they are discovering vulnerabilities or actually managing the vulnerabilities internally, they may have a requirement for alerts and warning taking in different alert bulletins from different vendors, bringing them together and sharing them with the right people. Or handling artifacts, if you're managing virus analysis, if you're doing malware analysis, are you going to look at those malware artifacts and actually do research into the root cause of them? Then you have the proactive ones, and these are usually added on after the incident handling capability as well doing uh, proactive announcements or technology watches, performing audits or security assessments, providing access or uh, development of security tools and helping build secure infrastructure, maybe doing intrusion detection, and of course, information dissemination or uh, training as it's sometimes mentioned on the next column. This next column, they're not really proactive or reactive, they're security quality, um, so, you know, doing risk analysis, uh, security consulting activities, awareness building, or doing uh, security awareness training or education. And some teams even build up quite a large team to do product evaluation to make sure that products are appropriate and secure before being deployed within the networks. And again, let me just reiterate, these are not mandatory services for a CERT team. These are different options and every CERT team will evolve differently. 
some cert teams will only do incident handling, and that is perfectly fine, perfectly acceptable. The incident handling is the core of a cert team. Some will then build on to some or many of these additional services. So the order of services that are very common, again, not mandatory, but common, is looking at after doing your uh, incident handling, then looking at building on incident prevention. Because if you're handling a lot of incidents, you sometimes want to get in front of that and stop them before they happen. Because less incidents means less work for the incident handlers. A lot of times the analogy is used of a fire department here. A fire department responds to building fires. But a fire department will sometimes do proactive work, going out and making sure that buildings are up to a building code or specification, that the fire systems are installed correctly, that there's fire extinguishers made available, and they'll do that prevention because if you spend some of your time preventing incidents, you will have less incidents to deal with afterwards. Some teams will then build on incident detection capabilities. This can sometimes blur into SOC capability, SOC or Security Operations Center, where they actually set up intrusion detection systems, monitor firewall alerts, and will actually bring in that information to detect incidents quickly. Incident resolution. Now, in the full transits course, we break this down more, but there's two slightly related but different terms here. You've got incident handling and incident response. Incident handling is all about coordinating the response of the incident, and incident response is actually hands-on keyboards responding to the incident and getting rid of the vulnerabilities and the threats. So slightly different there. So that's why incident resolution and on-site handling is one of the more advanced steps that a lot of CERT teams will add on. And then after those things, it is very common to build on incident quality management. So building on more of your lessons learned, building on more of your loops of information. So take the output, feed it back into the input to be better prepared in the future. And of course, Something that is another differentiating factor here is that the CERT team is not focusing on punishment and repression. The CERT team is focusing on managing the incident and minimizing the impact to business operations. And that's a really important thing to understand there as well. The CERT team is not the law enforcement. It is not going out and punishing the users. It is managing and handling the incidents and the incident response. Now, we've got um, tools and facilities for CERT teams. Um, of course, there's going to be tools for managing the incident reports, and then tools for doing detection and analysis and other things. Now, this depends on the different services that a CERT team will have. On the right side, you see mention for processing and analyzing logs. That's a pretty core function of a CERT team. But the forensics tools is at one of those added on services. Do you have to perform network forensics or hard drive forensics or mobile phone forensics? If a CERT team is doing forensic capability, those tools are going to be a very integral part of that. Information sharing, very common, even if you're only doing incident response, having labs, having separate testing systems, and trying to access additional information, whether it be from public or semi-public private sources, such as querying databases of passive DNS. A CERT team will usually need some sort of office facilities, and this starts getting more important as you have a dedicated CERT team. If the CERT team is existing staff that are using, say, 50% of their time for CERT operations, the actual secure room and office facilities is not as important. And then, of course, there are references here, and the transits training will take a lot of this and go into much more detail. Again, this is just a high-level overview of different aspects. Looking at cooperation, interaction, and disclosure of information, CSERTs don't normally work in isolation. 
This is what I was talking about, the first organization, cert teams getting together and sharing information. You have to understand what information can be shared, what information needs to be sanitized first, is there any conflicts of interest, and of course, is there a legal perspective that needs to uh, be taken into consideration. Uh, one of the very useful additional resources to a cert team is having access to a legal uh, counsel or a legal professional or a lawyer so that you can actually ask a lot of these questions and make sure the CERT team is operating legally. Now, of course, the CERT teams will interact with other CERT teams, but local inside of the constituency, you may be working with other departments internal to your institution or corporation. You may, of course, have to work with other CERT teams, other vendor teams. You may have to work with law enforcement if the organization is looking at doing legal um, investigations. And of course, you may have to work with the media as well, particularly for those more public security incidents. Within the security response community, there is a lot of trust between CERT teams, but that trust takes a while to build up and sometimes takes face-to-face -face interactions. If someone has only interacted with you over email, it can be very difficult to assign a high level of trust to that person. So a lot of these CERT teams will have these face-to-face -face meetings and will have site visits in order to assess whether another CERT team is operating as a, a proper operational CERT. So that's one of those higher levels of membership into FIRST is to join the organization as a full member you'll have to have site visits where an experienced CERT team will actually come and visit you physically and actually go through and look at your setup and go through your policies and procedures and see how you are operating to make sure that you are a fully operational CERT team. You may be sharing threat intelligence. This might be indications of compromise or uh, IOCs. You might be sharing analysis and reports of the incidents that have previously happened and you may be detecting new vulnerabilities and therefore sharing that vulnerability information with the appropriate parties. You may be reaching out to other communities that might exist. The mention at the bottom here is AP Cert as well as Shadow Server and Team Cymru is another one. AP Cert is a group of government national Cert teams through the Asia Pacific region. So if you're having to work with CERT teams in another country or economy, you may have to work with the AP CERT community to make that connection and collaboration a little bit easier. Now, the cost of operating a CERT team is something that has to be discussed. And again, Transits will go into this in depth. This is just an overview. But the incident response capability should be built into your overall security program. You should have budget, for security program and security services, whether it is for staff, for external services or contractors, or for new tools and equipment that you have to be hiring. You want to have that built in because the incident response capability gives a good return on investment. By investing the time and skills into incident response, it can decrease the damage caused by incidents happening to your institution or organization. Now, some of these costs may have already been absorbed by other parts of the organization. This is useful if you're borrowing time from other staff, maybe the IT manager, a network engineer, and a systems administrator can all be formed together. These aren't new costs, they're existing costs that are being spread out. But the costs to a CERT team hugely depends upon the size of the team, depends on the services being provided, the nature of the larger organization or institution that you're operating, and the availability of existing tools and skills. If you don't have a lot of existing tools and skills, you're going to have to spend more money than expected on training the staff, sending them to specialized events and conferences, and purchasing or hiring the tools that are required. There are other considerations. This was taken from the Best Practice Forum or BPF for CERTs. This was from the, uh, the IGF Forum in 2014. Uh, we'll link through to the documents of where these are referenced from as well, but they provide a lot more information and details on the costs involved. 
Now we're talking about staff and skills. Obviously for a cert team, they're going to have to have some technical skills. But the important thing is, technical skills are not the only types of skills that are useful. The general skills, such as common sense, good communication, both written and verbal, being uh, very diplomatic, a quick learner, being able to operate under stress, being a team player, high levels of integrity, uh, owning up to their own mistakes, having good problem solving skills, um, you know, knowing how to search Google very easily. Um, and of course, time management is going to be useful as well. These are all very generic, but are extremely useful in a cert capability sense. The technical skills, of course, needs to match the features and the services being provided. If your cert team is doing malware analysis, you of course want to have somebody that understands reverse engineering. And above all else, CERT staff must be trustworthy. It takes a long time to build up trust, and it only takes one individual and one incident to destroy that trust that has been built up to that point. So you want to be extremely careful around who you are hiring, and you want to make sure that you have a good think about are you hiring ex-hackers and crackers? Are you hiring security professionals? Are you hiring people with a criminal history or not, they may have some good skills, but is the trustworthiness there? Is the level of integrity there that you need as an organization? You know, and the question at the bottom here, you know, how do you avoid hiring a hacker? And this is, this is really interesting. If anybody has, um, you know, some, uh, some thoughts on that, you can share that into the chat window. Um, but you know, how would you avoid hiring a hacker? And right now, you know, you may already work in an IT department or a network engineering department. How do you know right now that you haven't already hired someone that has a criminal past or hiring somebody that performs criminal activities at night? And it can be very tricky. You know, there, there's not an easy answer to this, but if anybody does have any suggestions, I'm very curious to hear uh, you share your thoughts in the chat window through Zoom as well. Now, for CSERT staff, we already talked about having a, a manager, having some uh, operations or engineers or people in the staff like that. You may need your own IT staff. And as a team grows larger, you may hire people that specifically are doing research and development activities as well. So these are different types of staff. Again, it's not the, the largest list, it's just examples of core CERT staff. And of course, this list and skills will grow and change as the CERT team grows and matures. Now, the great thing about operating in a larger organization is that you can share the load for extra skills that you might require. You know, you may require specialist skills, like a Windows administrator who really understands that side of things. You may have that already within your organization. You may require legal advice. You may already have a legal team within your organization that you don't have to hire them specifically for the CERT team. They can use those existing staff and resources. The same thing for finance uh, controllers, public relations or communications or media staff that you may already have, and crisis management as well. But the key thing is you want to make sure that you have these discussions with the staff early so that the arrangements are in place. So when a critical incident is happening, you can call on the media team or call on the legal team and they already know who you are and the types of operations that you're going to be performing. So we'll go through and have a look um, very briefly at the incident response lifecycle. Again, in the transits course, we actually break down these components into uh, quite in depth, but we're looking at the incident response lifecycle. Now there's big circles in the middle here. Um, don't worry about that so much. We generally go um, from left to right through here and then we'll loop around. So you start off with preparation preparing for incidents, and preparing your systems to make sure that they are secure. And then you go through a phase where you are detecting the incident. 
So you'll have some sort of detection systems or people notifying you, and you'll do that initial analysis to determine whether this is an actual security incident or not. From there, you move over to the next phase, and this is usually broken into three stages. In this slide, it's grouped together into one, and that is containment, eradication, and recovery. Very briefly, containment contains the incident so it doesn't grow any larger. Eradication completely gets rid of the threat so that the actual uh, incident has stopped. And then recovery is getting your systems back to normal, basically getting them back to the point back at the green stage before the incident even happened. So each one of those three stages in that red box is actually quite large and detailed on its own, and we'll discuss that later in other modules. Then once the recovery is done and you're back to business as usual, it's then going through your post-incident activity. Go through a review. How did you manage this incident? Why did the incident occur in the first place? And what did we learn from managing this incident? How can we then take that information and feed it back to preparation so that we can be better prepared, have better procedures and tools, better training, and hopefully prevent an incident from happening, but be better prepared for the next incident that does happen. This diagram here is um, borrowed from the NIST organization, but there's several other lists of, uh, of incident response life cycles. They're all very similar. SANS has one as well, uh, sans.org, um, that has another incident life cycle. Again, almost identical to this one because these are very common procedures that have been developed over time. Now, I talked about this briefly before, incident response versus incident handling. So the incident response is your hands-on technical capability. This is actually doing your analysis and responding to the incident, actually performing the actions. Firewall response, virus response, forensics, re-imaging, that sort of a thing. The incident handling capability is more management. This is planning, logistics, and the biggest one here, coordination. Coordinating the different people who are responding. And this is quite useful because usually it's the incident handlers doing the communication with senior management so that senior management isn't bugging the incident responders while they're responding to the incident. The incident handlers can be the ones providing the updates and keeping all of the senior management informed and up to date on what is happening. This is also borrowed from the Incident Command System, or ICS, linked from Wikipedia here. And here you can see having a coordinator and a team leader, but then having a separate team for operations, separate team for planning and logistics, and only having one point of contact, that's the team leader communicating with them. Then the team leader is the one talking with the coordinator, talking with the liaisons, and talking with that senior management. So we'll just go through a couple scenarios briefly here. And, you know, we want you to think about, you know, how would you handle this incident as we talk about them? How would you prioritize tasks to actually respond to the incident? What kinds of tools or skills would be required to handle it? If you needed assistance with these incidents, who would you contact? If the media contacted you, what would you say? or who would communicate with them? And of course, what would you do after the incidents? So the example here is a data breach incident. Here you have a vice chancellor's laptop or you know, the, the head of department or head of an institution. They receive an email with a malicious attachment. This actually infects a virus onto their computer and the computer then talks outbound to a command and control server Meanwhile, also the laptop is sending a copy of all the confidential information to an external website. You find out about this incident, what are you going to do? So just to, to, you know, not for you to type out the answers, but for you to just have a think about this one, how would you handle it? How would you prioritize the tasks? Do you have the skills to respond? If you needed assistance, 
who would you talk to? If the media talked to you about this, how would it go through? Who would do the media communication? And what would you do after the incident? And this is just one small incident with one laptop. Pretty serious, pretty sensitive information though, if you're looking at the head of an institution or organization though. Another one type of incident to think about is receiving a threat of DDoS attack. You know, here's an example one, uh, your site does not work because we attack your site. When your company will pay us, we will stop the attack. Contact the director, do not lose your clients. So it's a threat email and, and these literally have happened. Um, sometimes like this, very short and sharp, sometimes very long detailed messages that basically say, pay us money or we are going to DDoS and give you a denial of service on your network. And if you don't pay, then we would do a DDoS for 10 minutes and then you can pay us after that, but the price is going to go up. And then if you don't pay after that, we're going to DDoS your network for an hour and then the price will go up. And eventually organizations will either uh, implement DDoS uh, mitigation techniques or if the DDoSs are very large, some organizations may end up paying the ransom for these types of attacks. But how would your organization deal with this? Who has the authority to deal with this? Who has the authority to pay money? Because essentially these are criminals. And what if it's found out that you actually paid ransom money to criminals? And who's to say that if you pay the money that they will actually stop the DDoS attack? What if you pay the money and they keep attacking you? And then what if the media finds out about that? How are you going to manage that? How are you going to address this threat? Very, very tricky scenarios, very common as well. Um, you know, we're, we're not making these scenarios up. These ones are actually taken from uh, past experiences for a lot of organizations. So that's just an overview of all of that. Um, Dinesh, did you want to go through and do the, uh, the overview of what the, uh, the transits modules look like? Yeah, I think it's, it's better, Jamie. So, well, I think uh, Jamie has covered like most of uh, all these components we are going to cover, but we'll be uh, uh, covering all these components going for depth of uh, these modules. Uh, so, uh, as I like, uh, mentioned before like uh, there will be uh, four modules we'll be conducting under uh, transits program transits one so organizational operational uh, technical and legal so these models will be covered by jamie and myself so uh, i'll give you like a, say a quick introduction about uh, organization module uh, well, this module will cover how uh, certs uh, fit in their organization and uh, how, we, uh, how, how we can uh, planning, planning a team and defining its constituency and uh, determining uh, what services uh, that cert can offer to constituency and uh, staffing as Jamie, uh, Jamie mentioned, uh, like whether we can uh, use the existing staff or we need to hire a new staff. Uh, and except for that, uh, communications uh, with, uh, with our stakeholders or with our members or relevant parties and uh, funding and uh, how we obtain management authority, how we get the approval to implement these services. Also, uh, we need to understand uh, where search should, uh, should fix in an organization because search should uh, have the link uh, direct contact with the board of the management or the accounts department, uh, IT department, operations department. Um, and also uh, we'll be, uh, we'll be uh, discussing uh, like the terminology as we, as we got a uh, question like what's the difference between CERT and CSERT, like CERT and CSIRT. So we'll be, uh, we'll be discussing that uh, in depth as well. Uh, how we can uh, uh, how we can uh, create a cert cert name terminology for a cert uh, and also uh, under under organizations uh, we'll be discussing about types of certs such as uh, academic certs 
national search, government search, and uh, and what are the critical infrastructure of search. Uh, yes, and uh, moving to uh, and uh, what are the services uh, we provide by search for its uh, constituencies of the management. Um, and uh, some, uh, and also we'll be uh, providing and sharing other resources uh, of uh, cert, uh, cert information for you all. So on the technical module, uh, we'll be covering how uh, intruders, intruders uh, attack system and their motivations and uh, protocols can be abused our network and uh, vulnerability of operating systems and services such as like a DDoS attack and uh, hiding traces and information gathering techniques. And there are different uh, practices we'll be uh, discussing uh, more on the technical module. And uh, what are the uh, threat agents? There are maybe all of, all of you all are like uh, from a technical background. Uh, so you all know what are the threat agents. Uh, so we'll be uh, discussing more in depth, more, uh, more information about it. Uh, and uh, yes, and uh, malware techniques such as in technical models, hacking and uh, defense and mitigation uh, will be uh, discussed, will be, will be uh, covered in that uh, module. And uh, moving to operational module, next slide, Jamie. Uh, this module covers uh, the incident handling. Uh, as, uh, as there is two processes, incident, incident handling uh, will be uh, like process from initial reports through triage investigations and resolution and closure to post analysis, including practical exercises and survey of useful tools. And uh, as Jamie uh, mentioned, the, uh, the circle of uh, operation model for incident response will be discussed in depth. Uh, and uh, roles, roles of uh, incident uh, response and incident will be uh, discussed, uh, like uh, such as like analysis and containment, and logistics under handling, logistics and communications, planning and coordinations, uh, or and uh, processes and procedures. Uh, under uh, and under operation model, we'll be discussing also incident management models, models which we used in uh, globally, which and also we care whether we can adapt in our in our local incidents as well in our operation. Uh, uh, and also, uh, we'll be discussing uh, the manager's uh, role in cert operations, uh, the management of team and uh, level of uh, preparedness of the team and interface and leading, uh, leading the post analysis effort. Uh, the last session, uh, last module uh, will be the legal module, uh, which covers uh, how, how the data protection, uh, computer misuse, uh, network monitoring, uh, collection of uh, evidence and working with law, law enforcement of agencies. As, uh, when it's, uh, in terms of law, well, uh, it should be applied. Uh, it, it depends on the country, country law, ter territorial law will be applied for the cert. So this will be discussed on the uh, legal module. Uh, what are the law enforcements and uh, how cert must operate legally uh, and or like legislatively? Uh, and there are like basic legal concepts that are relevant to certs will be discussed more and uh, like uh, under data protecting uh, international law and computer law uh, will, be, will be discussed more on that. Uh, and uh, finally, hacking your yeah, computer and different apps, apps also will be, uh, will be shared, shared to you, uh, which is uh, under, under cert, under data protecting. Uh, so, and uh, protecting copyrights and patents, copyright design and patents acts also will be discussed. And, uh, uh, and also we have like uh, materials un under these uh, modules. So we'll be sharing these materials to you all. Uh, so finally, I just wanted to like uh, mention that uh, this, uh, 
we, it, it is not required that uh, you should have a technical uh, technical knowledge or like technical personnel. Uh, well, if you like have understanding in main as aspects of working in an incident handling or in a response team would be better. And uh, technical knowledge and to take, uh, having technical knowledge is an uh, uh, added advantage for this conducting uh, following this course as well. Uh, so, Jamie, I think uh, we can share share the uh, form Google form for them, so we can get uh, get your feedback and uh, get your like uh, output uh, how we should uh, conduct this course to you all. So, please uh, fill this form and uh, submit to us as soon as possibly. So, we will uh, when Jamie and me like we'll have a discussion on this, we'll chat on this and we'll fix a date, uh, depends on the uh, class room size, still we didn't decide the size of the class. So uh, just let us know. So we'll share the link uh, at the chat, in the chat box, stream, maybe? Yep, I've um, put the link. It's on the slide that's up now. I also put it out through chat to everyone. Yeah, uh, chat does uh, protect the link um, so that you don't accidentally click or copy and paste it. So you will have to uh, copy and paste and, and edit it to take out the spaces, I believe. Wow. Um, uh, the information is there. Um, and if you want to do it from your mobile phones, you can scan the QR code, um, which will take you to the same link. Um, but uh, as Dinesh said, this yeah. form is very briefly feedback on this session, but the primary um, thing for this form is also registering your interest to attend the, the full transits course, those four modules that uh, Dinesh was just going through and describing. Um, so yeah, so please, if everyone could fill in the form, even if you don't plan or want to attend the full transits training, please still fill in the form. That, that's one of the questions and it keeps it short. Um, there's not uh, too many questions in that form. Um, but yeah, and you know, we'll get uh, these slides and uh, hopefully a recording of this session shared out to everyone as well. Um, you know, so you'll have a, a link to these references and the, uh, the other things that were mentioned in the slides. Now I did have one uh, question um, come in from somebody. Um, I'll just read it out. Um, you know, Mr. Gillespie, I'm happy to get this opportunity for the joint training session with you. Um, sir, in your career, can you highlight some major attack experience and how you prevent it or handled it? Um, so for the incidents that I've prevented, I don't know fully what I've prevented because the prevention was so good, which is always a nice thing. You know, you only know about incidents that are successful. Everything else is just a single line on your firewall logs. Um, but some of the major attacks that I have dealt with um, you know, I was working for a, a very large company um, and we did get a successful compromise. You know, the attacker did get inside of our network. Um, we were able to detect them before damage was done, um, but they did gain a lot of access to a lot of information. And the way it was actually handled was uh, monitoring the user, um, finding out what they were going after, trying to swap out the information that it was being allowed for them to gain access, basically giving them access to fake information so that they think they had something real. Um, and then at the end, we cut off their access and we upgraded the security on our systems. This was uh, several years ago now, but it was the start of using, for that organization, the start of using two-factor authentication because we found the weakness of how the attacker got in is they had gained access to uh, a users and engineers username and password and they were able to then impersonate that engineer by logging in with their username and password from outside the network um, so by implementing the two-factor authentication that was some of the lessons learned on how the attacker got in and what we could do to protect from that event but it would also protect against many more types of incidents that may come in in the future. So um, yeah, uh, I'm a, a, a big believer in two-factor authentication after that. Um, some other ones were dealing with uh, DDoS attacks. Uh, when I worked for a cloud hosting provider, some of our clients and customers were getting DDoS attacks or getting DDoS threats by email. 
that's where I've seen a lot of those email ransom messages come in. Um, and for that particular customer and the way that uh, we were operating at the time, we actually had multiple uplinks to different providers. And we had what we called a burn link, which was a, a lower bandwidth. I think it was um, only maybe one gigabit per second. And if the DDoS attack was coming in against one customer, we would actually route that one customer through the burn link so that it would fill the capacity on that link, but not fill the capacity on the other links that the other customers were using. So uh, we were minimizing the damage or the collateral damage against other customers by uh, restricting the one customer being attacked to their own link. Um, then we provided the opportunity for customers to subscribe to their own DDoS protection services. Uh, my company at the time that I was working for didn't provide DDoS mitigation, um, but you could buy it through a third party company and get that set up through like a, a BGP uh, tunnel or using um, DNS changing or things like that. So we provided it through that way. So that was a, a couple of the incidents. Um, very, very sanitized in it. But, uh, but yeah, that was a, a couple of the incidents. And then a lot of smaller stuff, you know, a lot of smaller uh, viruses getting onto computers. And, you know, from the virus impacting a computer, we realized that our antivirus solutions weren't uh, applied to all computers. We thought it was on everything, but there was a few computers that were missing. So not having a good inventory of assets and an inventory of which computers had antivirus software installed that led to those types of incidents happening as well. So yeah, you know, lots of incidents. It's, uh, you know, 20 years is a lot of experience for, for incidents, but those were some of the big ones. I'll just put the survey form back up and um, yeah. Uh, yes. So Jamie, like uh, we will uh, discuss and uh, we'll, first we should uh, go through the the survey forms and uh, we should uh, select a number of parties, participants for our uh, course. And then uh, we will let you know the specific dates that we can conduct this course. Uh, so I encourage everyone to uh, fill this survey and encourage all of you to join this course. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, I think we have shared our email addresses. In the meantime, you can drop an email as well. Uh, anything else, Jamie, you want to mention? Yeah, um, just when you fill in the feedback form, uh, when it comes to selecting the dates and times that are suitable to you, please make sure that you tick all of the options that are suitable to you. This will allow us to then find the most popular times for everybody. Um, and line them up. If everybody only put in one option, then we may not have common time. So um, please put in all of the days and times that would be available. Um, you know, we're working on both Dinesh's schedule and my schedule. Yes. You're mute, Jamie. Jamie, you're mute. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> I just talked a lot on mute. Um, <laughs> um, anyways, let me go back. Did I hit a button by accident? Um, yeah, make sure that you select all of the different days that are available. You know, if you only select one day that uh, you put in and everybody only selects one available day, then it's not going to give us a lot of commonality to find when everyone's available. Um, additionally, Dinesh is going to be running two sh sessions. Primarily, I'm going to run two. So if there's times where I'm not available, those could be times that Dinesh runs the sessions. Um, but uh, you know, cor correct me if I'm wrong, Dinesh, but we are looking to run these four sessions within the next month or so. So we are looking to get these moving along um, and get them running and, and over and done with fairly quickly. It's not going to spread out for several months. We'll get yeah. these in, get these done. Um, yeah. If you only want to attend one or two modules, that's perfectly fine. We won't be able to give you a full course completion certificate, um, but if you attend all four modules, you will absolutely uh, get in and, and get a, a full certificate for completing this course. 
Um, additionally, I just had two technical questions from two people pretty much about the same thing about two-factor authentication. So I'll just quickly answer these technical questions, um, but we'll save any other technical questions for the, the transits course and that. Uh, someone said, uh, do you think biometrics is a good option to prevent unauthorized access or 2FA is the best? Um, biometrics is a form of two-factor authentication as long as it's not just biometrics on its own. Remember, two-factor would be, uh, say, fingerprint and a password. If it's fingerprint on its own, it's only one single factor of authentication. So definitely two-factor is good. Um, there's also a difference in the types of two-factor authentications. So, you know, SMS um, is technically not two-factor authentication. It's maybe two-step verification. So there's good two-factor and there's bad two-factor or, or not as good two-factor. That's a much longer conversation that we can get into later. But, um, but yeah, two-factor is much better. It, it, it's immeasurably better than single-factor, just username and password. Um, when it comes to biometrics, you know, for things like biometrics on a phone or on a laptop, um, that's tricky because there is some concern around biometrics because you can't change your fingerprint, um, but it all depends on how the system is working. If your fingerprint is only staying locally on a device, then there's less risk of that fingerprint being used for other purposes. But if your fingerprint is being registered into a online distributed database for authentication, that's where biometrics can get a little bit messy. So understanding the technical implementation is hard, is important. Um, uh, someone else was asking if 2FA is risky. I think I answered that with the previous one about biometrics. Again, it's a much larger discussion that goes beyond the, the time that we have available for this session. Um, and someone else is asking, can you briefly explain how to contain and eradicate security incidents? I won't answer that because that is one of the security modules of transits um, where we actually break down and fully discuss containment and we fully discuss eradication. Um, but, but very simply, containment is stopping it first and eradication is getting rid of the badness off of your systems and off of your network. Um, but we do go in depth into that, uh, into the actual full transits course. So um, definitely register and, and attend those uh, modules as we discuss them. Okay, Jamie, thank you very much. Thank you those questions. Present. So Jamie, we can conclude the session. Yeah, I'm, yeah, I'm done. Is there right. anything else that you wish to uh, address to the audience, Dinesh, or are uh, you all good? No, well, I just, I'm just requesting the audience, my friends, to get registered, like, uh, I mean, uh, to join the online course. And uh, I highly, like, recommend you all to uh, follow the four modules, which is much better. But even if you, like, it depends on your time, like, uh, if you wish to uh, join just one or two, it doesn't matter. But uh, we would like to see you, uh, to see you like uh, following all four modules. So uh, if you have any necessary other corrections, you can like just uh, drop an email to Jamie or to me. Uh, if you couldn't uh, like jot down his email address, but I think you do have my email, so I can forward them to Jamie and he will get back to you. So uh, uh, again, thank you very much guys to attending and joining this program, introduction session program. So I hope you gained much uh, information, understanding, knowledge, and now you have a brief idea that what we are going to do in these four modules, online course. So I hope to see you at the course. <laughs> so Jamie, and thank you very much for your time as well. <laughs> so let's see how it goes, and let's keep in touch, and let's uh, try to fix the dates very soon for the course. Excellent. Thank you very much for having me as part of your sessions. Anytime. Thank you very much, guys. Thanks all. Thanks, thanks for like being with us. See Bye. you, everyone. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.